Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third live office hour for the MOOC on Environmental Security and Sustaining Peace. I'm Carl Brook. I direct international programs at the Environmental Law Institute, and I'm one of the core faculty for the MOOC. Once again, I will serve as a facilitator and offer a few questions as appropriate. I'm here today with Tony Andrews. Uh, Tony will give a more detailed introduction in a bit. To start, Tony is a principal and co-founder at the Center for Responsible Mineral Development. He was the lead author for the study that informed Bernarda Elizalde's lecture on conceptual frameworks and conflict pathways, which was chapter 2.9. Tony has an incredible uh, deal of multidisciplinary experience, has worked in government, academia, and industry. Today, we'll be answering a mix of questions, some that were submitted by question, students ahead of today's session and some that we are receiving from you live. We'll do our best to get through them all. If we don't, we encourage you to post your questions at the office hours and other discussion groups. And with that, Tony, um, I'm wondering if you might say a little bit about uh, the work that you do at the Center for Responsible Mineral Development and uh, how you got into that. Sure, thank you, Carl. Um, well, I'm a geologist by training, and um, that was many, many moons ago. And uh, I was uh, involved in exploration geology, uh, the effort to find mineral deposits. And then I spent um, about 23 years of my life as CEO of a, a large trade association in support of the Canadian mining industry. And um, in that role, I was very much involved in the public priorities of environment when that began in the 80s and the 90s. And then when the uh, public priorities shifted to the more social side of things in about the late 1990s, I was involved in leading the Canadian mining industry on strategies on how to um, handle that, manage it, get better and better at it as time went on. Um, when I left the association, I started my own consulting firm called, as you call it, uh, Carl, uh, the Center for Responsible Mineral Development. And uh, that's a small consulting firm that works with companies, governments, non-governmental organizations, communities, and uh, host governments in responsible approaches to mineral development. Um, I'm curious, you, you were trained as a geologist and there, there's often a, uh, a disconnect that I have found between um, the technical side and the social side. And uh, um, there are a lot of wonderful, perfect, perfect solutions that don't account for the social side and run into trouble. I'm wondering, how did you kind of learn the, the social side of this? Well, that was, from, from my perspective, purely experiential learning. So as I started as a geologist, and as uh, you, know, you pointed out, it, that has a focus on the technical side, geologists, engineers, all the kinds of applied sciences that work with the mining industry are focused on the technical side for obvious reasons. It's a very challenging um, endeavor to try and find mineral deposits that are economically viable. So, you know, people of my generation were not trained formally for the social side of things. So all of us, um, we learned, like I said, experientially. That is um, a very good way to learn. Um, you learn from your mistakes, um, and that's probably one of the best ways to learn. But when the social revolution, if you want to call it that way, began in the late 90s, none of us were really prepared for, uh, for that and how challenging it was, even more challenging than the environmental issues that came in a couple of decades before that. And um, so... We at the organization I work for, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, the PDAC, um, decided to develop a best practice guidance for our industry. It's called E3+. And it dealt with environment, 
social issues and health and safety. And in developing that um, online resource for not only the industry, but also for host governments, communities, non-governmental organizations, we, uh, we're on a steep learning curve. And, you know, over the years, as, our, as the industry endeavored to um, develop approaches to the challenges that they face on the ground at the sites of their operations, we all learn together like that. And the whole field has evolved over the last 20 years, but now there are courses um, at the level of universities and by institutions around the world to um, actually formally train people and document the experiential learning that we've all gone through over the last 20 years. Sorry about that long-winded answer, no, no, but that's good. anyway. I'm, I'm curious, um, you talked about the, uh, the value of learning from often painful processes. Um, I've seen a lot of that in environmental peace building. Um, but what, what's often striking is that the, the painful experiences are not written up. We, we don't like to admit our failures publicly. Um, people may talk about them, but you don't, you don't, you know, and you may adjust, but it, to get that evidence um, or to say, this is why you should do it because so-and-so didn't and they had this outcome. Is there any tradition on the on the mining side of writing these things up, or uh, kind of in a, in a clear-eyed way, or um, or is it really based on the individual practitioner? Well, that's a very interesting question because um, during the conflict study, um, we ran into this particular barrier, um, especially in the literature review part of that study. And when we did the literature review of conflict associated with mining, we looked at over 300 publications. And these publications were dominated by um, the academic area and by non-governmental organizations. And there was very little contribution from the mining industry. And yet, there, there is at least 20 years of experience and experiential learning by the mining industry. So the issue there, is that mining companies, they either have internal expertise that does this kind of work and tries to figure out how to solve issues on the ground and documenting learning and getting more sophisticated at these things. But normally, these are confidential internal reports. The other way they do things is by hiring expert consultants. And normally, these consultants who are, um, over the years, have developed into very experienced uh, field social practitioners and have a lot to share as well, the kind of work that they do for companies is also confidential. So a huge amount of this work is residing in company files, but it's not available, generally available to the public. That's a big issue. And um, I don't think there's an easy way to crack that one uh, unless somebody decides that uh, they're gonna try and get industry cooperation and pull it all together and try and document it. Maybe uh, an organization like the International Council for Mining and Metals might do that if they thought that they wanted to make that kind of contribution to the general field. I think it should be done. I think there's a huge amount of knowledge residing there. Yeah, we've been, we've been looking at this in other areas of environmental peace building, thinking about trying to develop what are called failure fests and you know trying to figure out how to, because there are some spectacular problematic efforts that can be incredibly powerful in motivating people, but they're not documented. <laughs> well, it's not totally blank. There are some ways in which this kind of information has got out to the public. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there have been some academic studies where they have interviewed a whole number of um, mining companies and gathered the information that way. Mm -hmm. um, some mining companies give presentations at uh, conferences, what they've learned, what they recommend. Um, in some cases, they've been very open and transparent about how they failed and um, what they plan to do to try and mitigate uh, those kinds of failures. But um, there's not a lot of those kinds of studies. Um, so that's the issue. I, and like I said, I think it would be very, um, a, a real contribution of somebody who was able to gather all of that information and make it public. Um, you mentioned transparency, uh, at least in, in regards to that uh, aspect. We have a couple of questions here on transparency. I wonder if uh, we might um, turn to those. Um, one, uh, transparency and access to information are key elements of good governance. Uh, is there a, a particular example in your experience of an entity that innovatively and successfully made access to information a key part of its minerals intervention, I think is what they're trying to say. Um, sure. And I think what that, um, where that goes for me is um, when a mining company is conducting exploration or operation, the transparency element comes in as to keep the local communities totally informed about what they're doing and how that development is occurring. And even prior to that, it should occur at uh, the, the very beginnings of exploration and even before, so that the uh, mining company communicates with the communities about what they plan to do, how they would like to do it, and um, get the communities involved right at the get-go uh, in the decision-making process, so a shared decision-making process. So the communities can um, voice their recommendations on how things should be done, what things they would like the company to avoid. Mm -hmm. So that process should continue right through not just the development of a mine, mining operation and through that operation, but right through the closure. So there was a particular example. Um, this happened to be in northern Canada where um, a mining company was actually starting to develop the mine, build the mine, and this was a, quite a big complex. And there had been good engagement and communication prior to that. But what they did was they set up a website that was continuously updated and maintained, and any member of the community could access that website at any time and get a summary um, in layman's terms, not in all technical terms, as to what was happening, what, what stage of development, what they were focusing on on the moment. Um, they could ask questions um, and um, arrange meetings to that website. So um, that kind of technology enabled the company to keep the local communities, and there were a number of them, involved on a continual basis on a very complex process. I'm, so the related question, uh, some like this is, uh, transparency is not a word often associated with companies in the extractive industry beyond regulation. What incentives exist for companies to participate in transparency initiatives? Well, I think in order to answer that question, you have to understand a little bit of uh, uh, the history of the mining sector. It's very competitive. Um, so at the beginning, their, their assets are land and a mineral deposit. And then putting together the finances in order to develop that deposit. And it, the it, it's a, a, a very... Um, um, financially in, in, impactful, and, and um, what am I trying to say here? It's, well, quite simply, it costs a lot of money to mm -hmm. find and develop a mine. 
So because of that competitiveness, the mining companies have learned over the decades to be secretive and to keep information to themselves so their competitors can't find out exactly what they're doing and compete with them for that land. So um, there's a culture of not being transparent just in case their competitors um, will take advantage of information that uh, they have gathered. So, so that's, that's the background of it. it. It's not a culture of not wanting to share information with the public or with communities. So mining companies now have to try and maintain that confidentiality for, for their business purposes, but at the same time, be able to be transparent and share information with local communities. Because the incentive to do that is if they don't, um, that can generate concern and conflict. And where communities don't feel they're getting the right information or um, enough information, um, they can often resort to conflict or protests and conflictive behavior to get the attention of the mining company. So that's the incentive for the mining company to be transparent with communities and um, employ shared decision-making processes. And I, I know that's a bit of a... Go ahead. It's, it's a, it's a complex situation because, like I said, companies still have to maintain confidentiality in terms of their business competitiveness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about the, the, the different contexts in which uh, transparency plays out with respect to mining companies. Um, uh, I mean, are, are they more likely or less likely to make information on pollution available than uh, the revenues they're paying or the profits or I mean what's what what is what are the low-hanging fruit in transparency and what what's on the horizon well I think the there's a number of mechanisms that evolve have evolved over the last 15 years or so to help um, and incentivize mining companies and host governments to be transparent about the revenues derived from a mining operation and what is shared with the host government. And I and I that's the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is, is one of them, the EITI. And um, there are a number of other mechanisms that work on a more local level. The EITI is is sort of a, a global and country level um, process, but so that's that's on a financial level. Uh, mining taxes, royalties paid to host governments. I think so that's crucial information to know, especially for um, uh, local populations of countries where mining operations are happening. And by that, they can see how their own host government, what what, how much in how much um, revenues they're receiving from mining operations, and then how they're spending it um, with respect to um, passing on the benefit of those mining operations to the local population. In terms of contamination and uh, pollution, in many countries nowadays, the um, the requirement, the legal requirement uh, imposed by host government require those companies to report any spillages, any kind of leakages um, to state governments and national governments. So um, that is the sort of gold standard now. Um, so that has to be transparency there, and it's up to the host government to make sure that companies comply with that. And I think that, you know, that was not something that existed necessarily 25 years ago, but it certainly does now. And there's more and more developing countries with mining industries requiring that to happen. 
Um, wondering if we could shift gears for a, a, a little bit. Um, the conflict pathway model that you uh, that, that you and Bernard have been developing it emphasizes the importance of thinking about causes and drivers at various temporal and spatial scales from global to local. How is your thinking about conflict processes at the global scale been helpful in your experience? And I well, would say, well, how has it evolved? I think that would also be interesting. Okay, so what the way our thinking works here is that first of all you start with a conflict situation that occurs in a particular locale around a mining operation that's normally where it occurs that's what we call the the mining community interface so what we discovered is that um, initially the people who were focused in this area of trying to help uh, mining companies stay out of trouble and do things the right way. We're focused on trying to resolve issues that occurred at the mining community, the company community interface. And what we have discovered now in our conflict study is that that can be useful to a point, but it's actually trying to uh, solve a problem by addressing the symptoms. The actual conflict, however it uh, manifests, protests, sometimes in violence, um, is a result of a long history and a process that leads to that outbreak. So it's by understanding the history and process that led to that where, whereby you can then design interventions that are going to be most effective. So if you start with the conflict at a locale, normally, like I said, at the community company interface and trace it back, you do the detective work and trace it back. If you go back far enough, in most developing countries, you'll find that it started with colonialism. And the effects of colonialism in many, most countries, I would say, still exist. So out of coloni colonialism came a centralist approach to government. And from that, or also along with that, you have very weak local governance. So the presence of government in regions rural regions where mining normally occurs because that's where the mineral deposits are, you have a lack of presence of government. And because when developing country governments decided to open the doors and invite foreign direct investment in for the development of their mineral resources, in other words, the large scale mining industry, they were invited in the host governments were not prepared in order for how they were going to govern that activity. Um, the local communities weren't prepared for the arrival of the mining sector. So there was no strategic approach to mineral development. And as we have documented in our studies, um, the two, phase one and phase two studies of our of the report that uh, resulted from this study, when you, you can draw a very clear line from colonialism right down through the process I've just described to you in terms of centralized uh, government, um, weak local governance, lack of presence of governance in rural regions to actual conflict at the sites of mining operations. So, what I'm not saying is that uh, mining companies often are perfect and they never um, are involved in the instigation of conflict. No, I'm not saying that. They certainly are. But what we're trying to do in our phase two study is also talk about the role of host governments in the way they governed the development of their mineral resources and how that either led to sustainable, sustainable development or sustained conflict. Mm -hmm. 
I hope that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, it, it does lead to another question. Uh, that, that's my question, actually. But I um, I remember talking with someone who advises extractive companies and uh, um, going into uh, sensitive situations and. The company had been in enough of these that it knew it takes time to build trust, to to talk with the communities, to figure out what they want, and to figure out what the mining company can or is willing to provide, and to work something out. And the, generally, they thought that you know, before before they really started operations, they they wanted at least a year for those discussions. And uh, uh, the the mining company went to the government uh, and said, we'd like to have a year for consultations. And the government said, fine, but you need to start in three months or we will revoke the permit. We want the revenues to start flowing. And I'm wondering, what what's a company to do there when you're actually really trying to do the right thing, to manage the conflict, to work with the communities, and the government is pushing for uh, to get rev revenues in sooner rather than later? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question, and normally everybody's in a rush. They're very impatient to get things moving, and that's fundament a fundamental issue around this whole thing. I mean, if there was enough discipline to, by everybody to slow things down and to go at a pace where you can build the kinds of um, expertise and governance infrastructure that you need and experience, things could be a lot different. But um, governments are very impatient uh, to get foreign direct investment because they need it. Um, there's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of things that uh, host governments want to do to, I guess, strengthen the economy and build the economy, increase quality of life and so on. So there's a real impatience there to get uh, foreign direct investment in, mining companies into concessions, build the mine, get it operating, start getting revenues to the central government. At the same time, um, the mining industry is subject to investors. So most of these companies are public companies, they're not private companies. There are some private companies, but they tend to be the minority. I would say the vast majority are public companies. Therefore, they raise money of the capital markets and they're subject to investors. Investors are also very impatient. Investors want to see um, the share price go up. They want to make money. They want to make capital gains. Um, and they don't like it when things go slow and you know they don't see return on investment. So there's a lot of pressure from different angles, not just government. Um, to see things happen quickly and uh, and the return on investment realized, the 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 detriment to all of this are happens to local communities, and uh, they're the ones that suffer the consequences of all of this hastening to try and get things done. Now, nowadays, I think it's more possible. To, for companies to work with the host government on a more intelligent um, process that is integrated by stages, um, because I think we've learned a lot over the past 20, 25 years. But 20, 25 years ago, when most developing countries were opening their doors to foreign direct investment, um, that was not possible. It, it just wasn't the capability of the time. But I think now it is. So, so people are people are more aware of the risks in rushing through it. I think people yes, and I think people are more aware of the. Uh, mistakes that were made 20 or 25 years ago, and that the fact that we're paying for the consequences of those decisions now. Um, mm -hmm. Most developing countries, the, the challenges they're facing right now are a consequence of the decisions that were made 20 or 25 years ago, the ones that we've just been talking about. So um, there, there is a realization, there is a learning that um, 
what was done in the past is not appropriate. And um, especially for com countries that are just starting on the road, the journey towards mineral development, um, an example might be Sudan, where I've had some experience and that has a very high mineral potential. They don't have a large scale mining industry right now. And they are in a, an advantageous position to learn from all the, the mistakes that were made in the past and do it properly. The question is, will they? And other countries in the same position as, as they are. It, it, that's a very interesting question because uh, Sudan is, uh, Sudan has a lot of experience with oil, but oil, while they're both incredibly high value commodities, they're both, uh, well, they're both high, uh, oil and gold are high value commodities. Um, oil requires more capital to extract it. And a lot of the gold is being done artisanally. It could be done commercially, but it's it's a you know you have some different social dynamics in there too. Yeah, that that, that well, both both of them are capital intensive. Both oil and gas and mining are, are very capital intensive. However, in the case of Sudan, um, Sudan lost most of its oil and gas assets when they separated with South Sudan, and that's one of the reasons why Sudan was motivated to start focusing on, on, its, um, on its mineral resources. So um, I, the mineral resources in Sudan, as you pointed out, most of it's um, mined by artisanal and small scale mining. Huge at amount. least at the moment. Yeah, at the moment. So the government of Sudan realizes that they can, the country can benefit much more if, if uh, the approach to mining is organized and um, governed promptly, and uh, and they have a large scale mining industry um, who are willing to operate there. That's not the case now, um, yet, but hopefully it will be sometime in the future. Does the uh, artisanal mining contribute taxes, or it's more on the livelihood side? Is is this uh, well in Sudan? That's an interesting question because in Sudan, um, a certain proportion of it is taxed by the government, but not all of it. And so they face the similar problem that most developing countries in Africa and Latin America do, and that is they have an informal. Um, uh, artisanal and small scale mining industry that uh, mines and gold, for instance, and other commodities too that get into the international markets, but the government is not gaining any tax revenue from it. So the challenge is to formalize and regulate that artisanal and small scale mining industry, which is a very complex uh, issue and challenge that um, I don't think any country has really resolved satisfactorily yet. And it's a big challenge when you're thinking of inviting in the large scale mining sector, because one of the things that was not done well in the past was to reconcile a pre-existing artisanal and small scale mining sector with a large scale mining sector coming in. And um, while host government in preparing to invite the large scale mining industry um, provided um, concessions and organized the land into concessions for the large scale mining industry to take advantage of. They didn't do the same thing for the artisanal and small scale mining industry. And so that led to competition for land and ultimately conflict and often, oftentimes between the large scale mining industry and the small scale mining industry. Are there any good examples out there, or, or at least uh, better examples of bringing in, uh, of doing that transition from uh, art, artisanal mining to large scale mining, or is it is that necessarily a fraught process? I think the best examples involve individual mining companies who have. Uh, discovered that 
on the concession that has been given to them by the the host government, there are pre-existing artisanal and small-scale mining operations occurring. And these companies um, have made have negotiated with the small-scale miners uh, to share basically the resource and and the concession. And in some cases, and, and there are cases in primarily in Latin America, Central America, and, and some Latin American countries where this has worked out quite well. Um, unfortunately, in many other examples, um, the artisanal miners have um, been motivated to invade the, and, and sorry to use that word, but uh, the concessions, it, it's against the law of those host uh, countries for artisanal miners to do that, but they do it anyway to try and continue their livelihood on prospective land that is now owned by the large scale mining companies. And when that happens, oftentimes the solution by the host country is to bring in the army or the, or the police to remove them, and of course, that leads to conflict. So, and that's a result of the fact that the host government did not consider the previously existing artisanal and small scale mining sector and how it was going to coexist with the large scale mining sector. I'm, I'm curious about the, the places where it works. Is that how much of that is because of the, the legal framework? How much of that is? the um, culture or the, the culture of the particular mining company. So why, why does it work better in, in, the, in some regions? That's a good question. And I, I think in most of the examples that I'm aware of, Carl, it, it's, it's the instigation of the mining company because they realize that there's a significant risk there if they don't if they try to ignore the the small the artisanal and small scale miners that are present already and they have been already, they are aware of problems that companies have run into by ignoring them, and so they decided they decide that the best way to handle that risk is to try and uh, share the resort and even help. The, small, the artisanal and small scale miners in their operations to modernize their operations. For instance, if it's the gold operation to bring their product to the mining company smelter, they will buy the gold from them and then um, run it through the smelter. So, you know, there's different ways that you can make this work. I wonder if we could shift a little to uh, end of life on a, on a mining project. Um, there, we're starting to see some places that have been uh, extracting resources uh, that are inherently limited um, for decades. I'm thinking, for example, Sierra Leone, where the diamond, uh, I, a number of people are thinking that the diamond mines are starting to uh, be exhausted and need to think about life after diamonds. And um, uh, there's a similar question, not so much on mining, but in uh, Timor-Leste, about what happens after their oil and gas runs out, um, or Nigeria and their oil runs out. Um, how, now, mining companies don't generally, that's not something that, that's for them to worry about. That, you know, they, they extract it, they pay, Pay what they need to pay, manage the uh, environmental uh, side better or worse. Um, but how does that work from a from a social or a policy side? Okay, so that's a great question. And um, in the distant past, um, the decommissioning and mine reclamation process requirements from government um, were not robust. And what that led to was a lot of um, mines that were not decommissioned very well. And as the, the 
policy and regulatory environment for decommissioning and reclamation evolved and became more robust, there was quite a bit of catching up to do. Nowadays, uh, where you have a proper governance environment for um, mining industries, a company cannot get their license to start mining until they have a proper plan in place for decommissioning and reclamation and a funding mechanism as well. And so the government will look at this decide that it uh, meets the standards that they set, and then they will provide uh, a license to mine so that the mining operation can begin. So in terms of the large scale mining industry, um, decommissioning and reclamation is pretty well developed now. And it, and it costs a lot of money. So, I mean, it, the, the putting aside of funds for this has to start with the beginning of the mining operation. When you talk about artisanal and small scale mining though, there, there is no similar regulatory environment. And there is a, just a huge amount of environmental degradation resulting from artisanal and small scale mining because they're not regulated. And uh, they go from one place to, the, to another very rapidly, oftentimes in, in rivers. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking of Ghana in particular. This is one of the countries we included in our case study uh, of the conflict and mining research that we did. There is just a huge um, artisanal and small scale mining sector there that has been transformed into, uh, it, it's been mechanized. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the amount of environmental degradation is very significant and it's, and it's been multiplied uh, 10 times or more as a result of that mechanization. So the, the Ghanaian government has had a big challenge in trying to control that. They've lost control of it essentially. One of the things that I thought was very interesting in Sierra Leone, um, because it, often the, uh, even if there is a reclamation bond that might be required and even executed to uh, pay for closure, that is, as you indicate, almost never enough that the, the costs really are much higher. Um, Sierra Leone started doing uh, um, essentially uh, reclamation, not reclamation, but closure as they go They're in new tile. So they do, um, you know, they mine here and put the waste there and then they mine here and put the waste in the old mine. So they do the, you know, the piecemeal closure. Is that something that's done in many places? Is there a reason it isn't? It is, um, especially in open pit mines where, you know, the impact of the land is a lot greater than a, an underground mine. Um, I've seen that practice in quite a number of places and uh, mining companies are motivated to do it because it benefits them too. I mean, uh, when they come to close the mine and decommission it, they're not starting from uh, point zero. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it has already been done. So it, it works for the mining company as well. Now, I'm not saying that this happens everywhere because it, again, it all depends on the uh, requirements, the regulatory requirements that the host government imposes on the industry. If those requirements are not to global standards, then it's up to the companies to, in spite of that, do it um, to the highest standards possible anyway. But let's face it, there are always players that are willing to take shortcuts if the regulatory requirements don't require them to do that. I imagine it also depends on the geometry of the situation. So if, if you have strip mining, and you're just kind of going across the landscape, it's easier to put the, the rock fill or the, 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 the remaining rock behind you as you go forward. But if you have like a, some of these big mines that go down and out, you, you can, it, that, that's harder to do. I, I don't know how you do that. That's a whole... Um, technical challenge all in itself. It, it, tailings 
um, the waste that uh, is derived from mining, um, it's just a whole world unto itself. So when you mine material and you crush it um, down to various sizes, it takes up more space than the original rock in the mine does because you've crushed it. Therefore, it takes more, uh, more volume. So you can't stick it all back into the mine. You can, you can put some of it back, but you all, will always have additional waste material on the surface. And the reclamation is all about how you um, return the land as close as possible to its original um, and you know, how you can use the waste that's brought up from below in order to do that. And the challenge there is, um, in some cases, there are heavy metals and, and sulfide materials that are part of what you brought up and reside in the tailing. So you have to somehow make sure that um, that is rendered inert and doesn't leak into the environment and cause problems that way. But um, talking about this subject, um, I learned recently that uh, in Brazil, um, I think it's pretty common knowledge that Vale, one of their tailings dams was breached and uh, it caused a huge amount of damage and loss of life. And what they're going to do now as a result of the studies that they did, they are decommissioning, I believe it's 10 of their 110 or so tailing um, impoundments in the country. Now, in that case, they've been mining primarily iron ore. So what exists in the tailings is mainly sand with a fair amount of iron in it, iron oxide. That is um, not a huge um, environmental issue in terms of contaminants. So what they're planning to do, what they're trying to figure out whether they can do economically is in the, in the tailings, it's mainly sand. So they can make that sand marketable. Um, there's many uses of that sand, as long as they can remove some of the iron out of it, they will sell that sand into the market and then use the funds derived for social um, work, social development in local communities surrounding those operations. So I think that's, that's very positive. And I think it may, it's very exciting, actually, it may lead to um, real progress in figuring out how to handle tailings that are usually left behind after mining operations. We had talked a lot about transparency. I'm wondering about the more participatory side of things. You know, transparency gives people the information, whether it's government or communities, to know if there's an issue, if they need to engage, how. But I'm wondering about the mechanisms for stakeholder involvement or consultation across that spectrum. I'm wondering. Um, what sorts of lessons you have seen in stakeholder engagement, or which approaches work in which circumstances? Well, one of the key ones, Carl, is this, that um, initially, early in the game of community engagement, um, companies often um, decided that they what knew what was best for communities. Um, communities were often um, not used to large scale mining, uh, obviously. Um, they were never properly prepared by their host government for the arrival of a large scale mining sector. Many of them were not well educated, so they wouldn't have appreciated a lot of the technical aspects of this. So mining companies decided that they knew what was best for the community. And what they learned over time was making decisions for the communities um, for them without their participation um, resulted just in a lot of dissatisfaction, lack of trust, and in many cases, conflict down the road. So this approach now has been um, replaced 
to a moderate degree by shared decision making. And there's various mechanisms for that. Um, for instance, one, uh, a company, if they have um, two or three local communities close to the operations, will set up committees uh, that consist of community leaders uh, and the and the mining company itself and possibly uh, non-governmental organizations that are present in the area. It would be nice if government was involved in some of this. Sometimes they are, more often they are not. But then um, they make, uh, those committees are set up for transparency, um, transfer of information uh, in both ways, from the mining companies to communities and vice versa. And shared decision making. And um, in some cases, this may take the form of a foundation. Um, so if the company wants to do this in a bit of arm's length um, way, rather than directly, they can set, set up the foundation, fund the foundation, um, let the foundation really manage itself uh, and have the uh, communities have more autonomy, if you want to think of it that way, into making recommendations, decisions that the company will then uh, try and implement. So there are a number of different ways to do this. Um, I think we've, we're coming to the end of our time. Are there any other points that you would like to raise before we close out? I think one of the things, oh, there were a number of things that came out from our studies, of course, but one that I found very interesting was the whole concept of decentralization, um, devolution of uh, governance and power and decision making from central government to local government. And we found that in the vast majority of cases we looked at, decentralization uh, or deconsolidation which is uh, deconsolidation is when the government decides, okay, we're going to put various offices in local regions, especially where development is taking place, like mining, in order to have a presence and participate in that development and, and also in social development. Um, so neither deconsolidation nor decentralization has, has been successful in most of these countries, with one exception, and that was in Bolivia. Hmm. And that was due to um, the president of the time in, in the 90s in Bolivia, who was a very progressive um, and ran a very um, constructive government, if you want. And one of the things they did was that they launched a very successful decentralization process across Bolivia where they empowered local government. And this has had a long-term positive effect. And uh, in spite of the, the situation that Bolivia is in now, um, uh, but in, in most other countries, they have not been able to implement that successfully. And I think finding the way to do that and um, giving up some of the power that the central government have at their disposal, which of course is a difficult thing to do, to to devolve that power to local government, is is a key to all of this. It's one key. It's not the magic bullet, but it's a significant one. That's a very good point. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Tony, and um, uh, thank the uh, students for their questions. Um, and. We will continue the office hours uh, in January. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate this. I, I find it a lot of fun. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.